Hello and welcome to a new video. This is going to be a little bit of a build crafting video where I go through how I would build something that is not quite off meta, but different from all of the typical things you see online. And today we're taking on the Arcane Knight or the Magus or the Spell Sword. It is a play style that lives in both the sword play and magic world. And we're gonna be competing against some pretty heavy hitters. So stick with me and let's see what we can come up with. All right, so the challenge here is how do we create a play style that is very gishy, gish being kind of equal parts sword play and magic that comes from way back in I think ED&D &D, where there was a Gith Yankee that was four levels of fighter and four levels of magic user, which created the Gish it has a bunch of other names now, but realistically, Gish is something that you're going to hear in all communities of d, &D. We have some big competitors in the Hexadin, the Sorkadin, a Swords Bard, Pure is kind of a good way to go, and as always, a Blade Singer. Blade Singer kind of lives in its own world because it competes with itself. The best way to play a Blade Singer is to just play a normal wizard with really high AC and really high constitution saves. So we'll kind of push that one out. We're going to be competing against a Hexadin and a Sorkin, two very meta builds that have kind of different ways to go about them. And we're going to do that using another meta build in a Sorlock. And hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Bear with me. I know a lot of you just went, Matt, you said this wasn't going to be a munchkin -y kind of build. Listen, we're not going to be building just an Eldritch Blast machine gun kind of coffee lock. We're going to be building something that is a true spell sword gish playstyle. We're going to do that with what I consider to be the most versatile version of this build. It kind of gives you access to a little bit of everything. I'm not going to assume that you're going to get any magic items. I'm going to assume that this is going to be accessed at pretty much all tables. So we're going to use no homebrew and we're going to do it using point by or the standard array. So here are the goals, very specifically. One, build a character that can seamlessly blend sword and magic in combat without sacrificing overall progression of the skills that they would be relevant in at that tier of play. So we're going to be looking at tiers one, two, three, and four. Two, they need to have decent defenses to be in melee combat. That can be AC, that can be high saves, that can be access to spells that reduce damage. All of those things are going to meet our goal number two. Three, it's going to need to meet a different niche than a Paladin or an Elder Tonight or you know, kind of one of those very stereotypical builds. Four, it's going to need to provide out of combat utility. So let's get started. For your race, it really doesn't matter what you pick, but I'm going to recommend going with either Custom Lineage or very Human to get a feat to start off with. If you don't want to use one of those, Half Elf is a very good option, Half Orc is going to be a very good option. Honestly, if you name it, you're going to be able to probably use it in this. It just may be a little bit different how you pick your feats. For our abilities, if we are doing point by, we're looking at eight in strength, 14 in dexterity, 15 in constitution, eight in intelligence, 10 in Wisdom, and 15 plus 2 in Charisma. If you're one of the tables that uses Standard Array, it's going to go 8, 14, 13, 10, 12, 15, plus 2. You're going to put that plus 2 from our Custom Lineage over into your Charisma range every time. We want to be starting at 17 where possible. If we picked a race that gets a feat, like a very Human or a Custom Lineage, I'm going to pick Resilient Constitution up front. And I know a lot of you are going to say that's a much better feat to pick down the road, but it kind of handles a lot of things for us. One, it's going to round our constitution up to the next tier, so we're going to start with 16 constitution point by, or 14 if we're doing standard array. So this gives us one additional HP to start with. It's also going to give us proficiency in constitution saves, which are very good from both a spell concentration save point of view, but also saves against cold and poison. It's a good stat to have proficiency in your saves. And then we want to make sure that our dexterity is sitting at 14 because in medium armor, you can add plus two from your dexterity stat to your armor class and no more than that. So 14 is going to be the perfect place to start off. All right, so first level, we're going to be going Hexblade Warlock. This is a very obvious choice. We're going to get our Charisma and Wisdom saves to start off. It's a D8 hit die, but we're also going to be getting our Martial Weapon Proficiency, Medium Armor Proficiency, Shield Proficiency, and then we're also going to get that filthy 
Hex Warrior trait to wield our one-handed weapons with charisma, and we're also going to get access as a bonus action to use the Hexblade's Curse against our main target in a fight, which means that we're going to get extra damage equal to our proficiency bonus every time we hit. We're going to get an expanded crit range down to a 19, and if we manage to get the kill on that target, we're going to heal for our Warlock level plus our Charisma modifier. We're going to start off with buying our equipment instead of going with starting equipment. This is because we can get a longsword, a shield, and scale mail for just around 75 gold, and then we will have an AC of 18 at level 1 to start with. And then we'll just use the rest of that money to buy the adventure gear, our bedroll, pitons, torches, rations, all of that fun stuff that you want to have in your bag as you're going around the adventure. Level 1 in Warlock also gives us two cantrips, two spells known, and one first level spell slot that comes back to us on a short rest. For cantrips, we're going to take Eldritch Blast and Prestidigitation or whatever other kind of utility cantrip you like. I just happen to really like Prestidigitation. It comes up in a lot of like fun roleplay opportunities. You can clean things, you can soil things, you can light small fires, you can do neat little tricks. It just makes you a little bit more versatile when it comes to goofing around in RP. We're also going to take for our spells, Arms of Hadar and Shield, which comes from the Hexblade Expanded Spell List. This means that once per short rest, we're able to boost our AC up to 23 at level 1. This is a very strong spot to be. It lets you kind of be up in the front line. And Arms of Hadar basically give us a very short range AoE in case we're in a little bit of a dicey situation against a strength save, which a lot of enemies you're going to be fighting at level 1 aren't going to be very weak. Level 2 is also going to be Hexblade Warlock because now we get Invocation, which means that we're going to grab the Agonizing Blast because now we are never not relevant in combat. We can do 1d10 plus our Charisma modifier in damage from up to 120 feet away, which is really good against flying enemies, times where we can't close the gap, or if we're very low on health, we can still be relevant in combat. Remember, 1d10 is equivalent to like a Glaive or a Halberd. So it's, it's a great weapon in terms of the size and capability, but our range is 120 feet with it right now. So we are now relevant permanently in combat. And then for our second invocation, we're going to take Fiendish Vigor, which lets us call cast False Light at will using no components, materials, anything like that, no spell slots. We can just spam it at will so that we can walk into any combat situation with 1d4 plus 4 temporary HP. Basically, just keep casting it until you roll a 4 or talk to your DM and say, listen, I'm going to be casting this pretty much at all times until I get a 4, so I'm just going to walk into combat with 8 temporary points. This is a tremendous boom at first level, or second level. We get a new spell and we get a second first level spell slot. I'm going to recommend taking Cause Fear at this point. You can pick an enemy on the field, make them make a save, and then they are frightened of you while you're concentrating. This means that they're going to have disadvantage on their attack rolls as long as you are in sight of them. Uh, they also cannot move closer to you, so if you want to stand in the back and protect your wizard or sorcerer that has low AC and low HP, the enemy is not going to advance towards them as long as you stand near them. Now, if you move up, they can obviously circumvent you, but that's besides the point. Level 3, also Hexblade Warlock, and here we get our Pact. We are going to go Pact of the Blade because now it lets us use our Charisma modifier for two-handed weapons, which means that we can switch from a longsword up to a glaive which means that we can now cast spells that have somatic and material components without having to do the juggling of you know, sheathing or drawing our sword in combat. It is going to lower our AC down to 16 because we're not going to have the shield anymore, but now we have reach on our melee weapon, so we can kind of mitigate some of the factors that come with lower AC by being a little bit farther away in combat. Also, for our spell, we're going to take the Mirror Image spell. It's one of my favorite spells, you're going to drop Cause Fear, you're going to pick up Mirror Image, because as a Warlock, you can swap spells once per level up. Mirror Image is going to give you a defensive boost. It's non-concentration, so you don't have to worry about that. And it's going to basically mean that up to three times when something hits you, you can cause it to hit one of your Mirror Images instead. This is 
an escalating chance for it, or I guess a de-escalating chance for it to happen, and it's going to save you hits over the course of the battle. It doesn't protect you from AoEs, but it will protect you from direct attacks. We're also going to grab the Hold Person spell, because you can completely shut someone down in combat by using that, and then any melee attacks against them are going to automatically be crits. It's going to basically take one person out of the fight and make them a very easy target early on in your adventure career. Remember, we're only level three at this point. So level four brings us level four in Warlock, and it's going to be our first ability score improvement. This is your chance to increase a score on your abilities by plus two or to grab a feat. Or in this case, we're going to be looking at grabbing a half feat to get our charisma up to 18. By making our Charisma 18, one, it's going to increase our ability to hit with our weapon and our spells by plus one. It's also going to increase our spell save DC by plus one. I really recommend feats that are going to provide a little bit of other utility. Fey Touched is a fantastic choice here for a once per day Misty Step, and then access to some of the best spells in the game. You can get Gift of Alacrity to improve your overall initiative. You can get the often banned Silvery Bars, you can get access to Command, Bless, and Bane, depending on what books your table allows. If you did not go down the Custom Lineage or Variant Human route and went Elf or Half-Elf, you can grab Elven Accuracy. This means that all of our attacks, weapon or spell related, if you are able to gain advantage either from the optional flanking rules, fairy fire, prone, you name it, it's not that difficult to generate advantage in 5e means that when you roll that attack with 2d20, you're actually going to roll that attack with 3d20 and pick the highest of the three. It is great for one, increasing your chance to hit, increasing your chance to crit, and also just overall increase your average DPR. Another good option is skill expert. You can grant expertise in any of the major social skills depending on how you like to play. Having expertise in deception, Intimidation or Persuasion can kind of present a lot of great face opportunities and stop a lot of things from becoming combat if you're able to kind of talk your way out of it, intimidate your way out of it. You know, just overall solve things before they come up. Also, might help you get better deals at the shops or, you know, get some favors from some of the people working around town that, that kind of need to be convinced to help you out. At this point, we get a new cantrip also Pick whatever you want. Booming Blade is a good option. Unfortunately, it can't be cast at the full range of our blade, but if you are within five feet of someone, Booming Blade becomes an option. Or you could get friends or, you know, you name it. Cantrips are kind of whatever you want to play with at that point. For our new spell, we're going to grab Invisibility. It's a great spell for one, sneaking around because we do not have stealth proficiency and our dexterity is capped at plus two. It is an opportunity to gain advantage at the beginning of a fight. It is an opportunity to kind of help you escape if you are in a dire situation where you, know, you don't want to be hit or you need to sneak away from somewhere. Invisibility is going to be a great option here. And with that, that brings about the end of Tier 1. So, where do we sit against some of the majors? Well, we're a pure class. Any pure class for the first four levels is going to be comparable to any of the other pure classes. If someone went with the Hexadin build, they only have three levels in Paladin, which means that they just picked their subclass, they have not gotten their first ASI, and they are pretty much a level behind in spellcasting progression. They've gained one extra short rest first level spell slot. So we're ahead of a Hexadin in this case. If you are looking at the Sorlock, if they went with the six Paladin version, we're pretty much on par. They're level four Paladin. They're going to be just as good at everything as we are. And if they went with the two Paladin, two Sorcerer route, they're going to be very strong at Nova damage. They're going to have access to only first level spells at this point. So they'll be able to upcast their smites on them. So we fall behind in Nova damage. We are ahead in overall just average damage. As we enter tier two, we're going to grab our fifth level in Hexblade Warlock, and this is key. Fifth level is a huge power spike just across the board. It's why I recommend everybody multi-class after fifth level. If you're a pure caster, you're getting access to third level spells, like us. If you're a marshal, you're getting access to extra attack, which we will. 
If you're a half-caster, you're getting access to second level spells, which is a tremendous utility upgrade for you. Fifth level is huge, do not multiclass before it, except in the most specific of cases, like a hexadon, where you're pretty much removing your strength requirement. But you're now a whole level behind, and depending on how fast your table levels, that could be a problem. So, what we're going to be doing here is, one, we're going to drop our fiendish vigor, and we're going to pick up thirsting blade. This means that we are able to attack twice with our attack weapon, so we just gained our extra attack. We're also going to pick up the Eldritch Smite invocation. This kind of gives us that Arcane Paladin feel. We're twice per short rest because we have two Warlock spell slots, and it requires that you use Warlock spell slots as written in order to do this. You can ask your DM to be a little bit more lenient once we start multiclassing, but rules as written, you have to use your Warlock spell slots. This means that on a confirmed weapon hit, we make the decision once we know that we hit, we can add 4d8 force damage to our overall damage output on that hit. We can do it once per turn, and if we crit on that hit, it is now 8d8 force damage, and anything that is huge or smaller is now prone, which means that if it doesn't have a hover speed while flying, it falls to the ground, which we can use if we conjure a longbow crossbow or something for our packed weapon and keep our blade on our back. You can smite things out of the air if you're using a conjured ranged weapon. We sacrifice a little bit of temp HP, but that's okay. We have other mitigations for that. We have our mirror image. We are going to be grabbing some opportunities for healing in the near future. We'll be okay. For spells, also the third level spells, we're going to gain access to Spirit Shroud, which means that within 10 feet, we're going to be dealing extra damage to enemies, either Radiant, Necrotic, or Cold. We're going to be preventing them from healing, and we are going to reduce their movement speed by 10 feet. This is great to keep on going at all times. We have access to it much earlier than Paladin will, which means that we're going to be able to optimize it to increase our overall damage in a way that Paladins get with, without concentration, but much later in their improved plots. This is a bonus action to cast, and runs for pretty much the entirety of the fight that you're going to be. We're also going to drop the Arms of Hadar spell, and we're going to pick up Hypnotic Pattern, because we can pretty much instantly shut down a combat by using that spell. Level 6! We're done with Warlock. We're, we got everything that we wanted from it. We're going to leave it in the dust. We're going to move over to Sorcerer. Specifically, I like Divine Soul because that gives us kind of that Arcane Paladin feel. But most importantly, it is going to give us access to both the Sorcerer and the Cleric spell list, which means that we now have three spell lists for the price of two. And we're going to be able to pick some of the most useful and powerful spells in the game that aren't, you know, wizard stuff. We pick your alignment, you're going to get an extra spell for that, that can be replaced in the near future. It's really just a flavor thing. It saves you from choosing Cure Wounds or Blast or Bane or, you know, any of those things. Inflict Wounds is a trap at this point. We're already level 6, we're into tier 2. It's not going to be doing nearly as much as we're capable of in just overall weapon damage, right? Inflict Wounds at first level is 3d10. Our Glaive is already doing 2d10 plus our Charisma modifier plus whatever we add on top of that from our Spirit Shroud and Smites and all that. So Inflict Wounds is a little bit of a trap in this case. You're also going to get Favored by Gods, which means that you're going to be able to add 2d4 to a failed save or check or something in the future. Save this for when you drop concentration on something important or when you really are just like this close to making a save, it can save you a lot of HP, stuff like that. It's going to be kind of important to, to save, but make sure we remember to use. I know plenty of Divine Soul Sorcerers who just go, oh man, I was this close, like, I wish I could make that save. You can't. You don't need that bard. You can do it yourself. As a first level Sorcerer, we get access to four cantrips. Pick whatever you like. It's kind of irrelevant. Utility is probably your best option. You're going to be able to get Guidance from the Cleric spell list. It's a good option there. Minor Illusion, Shape Water, Mold Earth. All those are really good choices for Sorcerer Cantrips. It's just kind of going to expand your out of combat and at will opportunities. We also get two spells and a couple of first level spell slots. 
We're definitely going to want to grab the Healing Word. One, this lets us play into being an Arcane Paladin, where we can kind of help out with healing, picking up our friends, all that fun stuff. And Magic Missile, at first level, you're going to shoot three darts. That's three different concentration checks against an enemy caster. If they want a shield, that means that they're using their reaction. They can't cast Counterspell. They can't cast Silvery Barbs. So it's a good bait as well. This is going to make us just kind of something to deal with enemy casters that are, are plaguing our uh, other casters or our frontliners. We're going to be working on being that in between, making sure that everybody is okay and filling that, that arcane paladin role. The paladin has his own problems up front and the sorcerer and wizard have their own problems in the back. We're going to bridge that for them. As we progress, obviously, we're just going to keep going Sorcerer at this point. So Divine Soul Sorcerer 2 is going to pretty much give us the flexible casting, which means that we're going to be able to cannibalize spell slots in order to get sorcery points. We can use sorcery points to cast spells. If you get to a point where you're going to short rest, but you still have your Warlock spell slots available, you can eat those and turn them into Sorcerer spell slots, which you're not going to regain. This is basically the capstone of Sorcerers, and you're getting it at 7th level. And you're probably getting a better version of it, realistically, because you're going to be able to turn a lot of Warlock points into Sorcery points. There's not really a whole lot else to grab. You get another spell known. Absorb Elements is going to save you a lot of HP. Uh, Shield of Faith is going to increase your AC back up to 18. Um, 19 if you've already gotten Half Plate at this point. Less is a great option. Kind of pick your points at this point. Level 8 is huge. It gives us Meta Magic. Say it with me, Meta Magic! We're going to pick Quicken and Twit. Now, this is going to give us the opportunity to throw around spells and use our melee proficiencies in combat at will. We're going to need to be abusing our bonus action and reactions here to make sure that we're able to keep this up. But overall, Quicken is going to let you throw out a big spell like a mirror image if you didn't get to precast it, Magic Missile or any of our other kind of classics that are typically actions, they're now bonus actions for you. And then you can either, if you're too far away to engage in melee, fire off an Eldritch Blast, which has two beams at this point, back at level five, or we're going to be able to attack twice with our weapon. And on those hits, you'll be able to be able to smite on top of that. So one really, really, really powerful combination that we have here is to quicken, hold person. If they fail, we're going to be able to automatically crit. When we crit, we can smite on top of that and deal just a ton of damage in one turn. Um, this is a two turn setup or a two character setup. We can now do it on our own. Twinned is also a game changer. We're able to twin healing words. So if there are two allies down, we'll be able to pick them both up with one bonus action. There are a couple other spells that are twinnable for us, not super relevant. But next level, we're going to be able to make another choice here that uh, is going to change some things. For our new spells here, because we are getting into our second level slots, Rhymes Binding Ice or Web is going to be fantastic for us. It's going to give us a lot of control over the battlefield. Rhymes Binding Ice comes from the Fizbin's book. It's a con save versus web, which is a strength save, I believe. Might be dex. It's been a little bit since I've used it. But it's pretty much going to be able to shut down an area of the battlefield. Level 9. We're one level behind in getting our ASI that would come at level 8, but we're going to get it now. I think it's a no-brainer. Max out our Charisma. That's another plus 1 to hit. It's another plus 1 to our Spell saves. It's another plus 1 to our Charisma saves, which is important if your enemy is going to be banishing you, but, you know, whatever. Other than that, your new spell, Guiding Bolt, can be twinned. That can be pretty big. That's, that's a significant amount of damage to put out in one turn and also advantage to your next ally, which can also be you, right? You can quicken a Guiding Bolt, get advantage on that after dealing your damage, come up and get possibly a crit and a smite there as well. You're going to have pretty big nova potential here. Level 10, we're now five levels in Sorcerer, five levels in Warlock, which means that we get access to third level Cleric and Sorcerer spells. Oh baby, it's time. Spirit Guardians, no brainer. You now emit an aura of, I don't want you near me, that enemies are going to have to walk through to get to you, taking damage, reducing their movement speed, and if you manage to get them stuck in that aura, 
it's going to keep just mowing through the options. There's a saying that a dodging cleric with spirit guardians is one of the best support players on the field. Well, now you are a Sorlock with spirit guardians upcoming, proficiency in constitution to maintain your concentration on it, and you still have all of your actions and quickened bonus actions to get through within that aura as well. You are a force to be reckoned with. Some other options that you might want to pick up, Fireball, always great, though at this tier you're kind of moving out of it. Fly is amazing for mobility. Counterspell, somebody needs to have it. You can be somebody. Same for Dispel Magic. Don't go for haste. Haste is a trap in this case. Unless you're going to haste to allies. You don't want to haste yourself because as soon as you get hit, you might end up removing yourself from combat for the next turn. So. I would not say haste unless you're going to be supporting, you know, a paladin and a barbarian or, you know, something that is going to kind of let you sit back with your squishy casters a little bit with your spirit. Well, I guess you can't have spirit guardians up if you're concentrating on this, but you can sit back and protect your allies while having those two be haste. So that's a good option. That brings us to the end of tier two. How do we compare? Well, we're five levels in Warlock were five levels in Sorcerer with access to the Cleric Spell List. In terms of competing with a Paladin, we don't gain Aura of Protection. Same for Hexton, they would have access to this. We have extra attack, so we're dead on par with all Marshals and half casters. We have third level spell slots, both from a Warlock and a Sorcerer point of view. A Pure Caster at this point is going to have access to fifth level spell slots but we're going to kind of be able to throw ours around a little bit more when we know we don't have to be so conservative with ours because we're going to be able to get a lot of them back from eating warlock spell slots that we don't use and converting them into sorcerer points or sorcerer spell slots. The Sorkadin, if they went with the six paladin build, they are now four levels into sorcerer, which means that they got their second MSI. They have second level spell slots. They're going to be able to upcast their smites quite a bit. They have their aura protection and they have their extra attack. And that's probably our main competitor at this point. If they went two sorcerer and eight paladin, they also got two ASIs. They don't have extra attack, but they do have access to fourth level spells because they don't have their ninth level or fifth level spells yet. So we're probably a little bit ahead of them as well, though they will be able to throw around spells a little bit more often with a little bit more flexibility, but I would say that it's about the same. Level 11, we're entering tier three. This is actually the last one that I'm going to focus on. Like I said, a lot of campaigns kind of end here. So overall, we're not going to be going too far into anything 12 and further. I'm just gonna scroll through my, my notes here and talk about feats and spells that I think are really good for us. But once we grab our sixth level on Divine Soul Sorcerer, we're going to have improved healing at the cost of sorcery points. It's kind of a ribbon feature, honestly. If you're going to use your sorcery points for that, I don't know, upcast healing or I don't think it's really worth it that much. Eldritch Blast gains a third beam, which means that our ranged combat technically surpasses our hand-to-hand -hand combat, but we don't gain the ability to smite on top of it. But it is a cantrip and it will do 3d10 plus 15 damage if we land all three hits. It kind of makes us a little bit more versatile in the space that we're controlling. Do we want to be up in up in combat? Do we get our AC high enough to be useful up in combat? Or do we want to kind of sit in that mid-range where our spells are you know, the most powerful and anything that approaches us has to deal with the fact that we can beat them down with a stick? It's kind of a good spot to be. From there, we're going to stay pure sorcerer. So fourth level spell slots, you're looking at greater invisibility, banishment, go back and grab some of the ones that we didn't talk about. 13th level is another ASI for Sorcerer. I really like Warcaster here to get advantage on your concentration saves. You can use Eldritch Blast as a reaction to an attack opportunity as long as you only target that one enemy. That kind of gets around the requirements for it being Booming Blade or Fire Bolt or any of that. Booming Blade, however, is a great option because you're going to lock people in place. Top is another good one. It's going to get your HP kind of up to where it would be if we stayed pure Paladin, maybe a little bit below because we've been rocking D6 hit die in the Sorcerer a little bit. A lot of good options depending on how you want to play. Great Weapon Master is going to give you a good opportunity to increase your damage with your Glaive. 
crossbow expert lets you use Eldritch Blast in melee range, so you can reflavor that as kind of wielding a lightsaber or an Eldritch Blade or whatever. Now you have three attacks, you're on par with a fighter. That's a really interesting option. You can't smite anymore, but you would have overall kind of more sustained damage. Ball Arm Master, I really don't like that as a pick here because our bonus action is already so bloated between Hexblade's Curse, Quicken Spells, converting spells to sorcery points. To get overall any value out of Polar Master, we're gonna have to sacrifice some of our other pillars of action in combat. And your reaction is probably also already a little bit bloated between shield, absorb elements, counter spell, silver barbs if your table allows it. So you're not going to get that enemy approaching attack of opportunity either. So Polar Master I think is a little bit of a trap. Don't don't 15th level, brings 10th level in Sorcerer, new meta magic, transmutation, or transmuted, I guess, however, Tord is a good option to get around a lot of resistances. 16th level, you are now an 11th level Sorcerer, which means that you have access to 6th uh, level spell slots. Grab the ones that you like. Chain Lightning, Disintegrate, Mental Prison are all very interesting Sorcerer spells. Uh, Fizbin's Platinum Shield is a really good kind of Paladin feel where you can protect your team a little bit more. And that gets us to the end of tier three. You are way ahead of half casters. You are way ahead of pure marshals in having access to six level spells. You're behind in pure casters because pure casters are just the epitome of power at that point. Overall, you probably found some magic items to boost your damage and your defense. You might have gotten an amulet of health to shore up your constitution all the way up to a plus four. You might have I found some interesting spell scrolls that give you some versatility. There's a lot of things that are useful to you at this tier that kind of bring all the options that you could ever want while having very good caster progression and very good martial capability. You're in a great spot at the end of tier three. Tier four, it's the end game. Let's be honest. 17, 18, 19, 20, you're looking at Sorcerer 12, 13, 14, 15, which means that you're looking at another ASI, grab one of the ones I just mentioned in the tier three option. Uh, you're getting seventh level and eighth level spells. Seventh level, you have a couple of good options. And Prismatic Spray is uh, a seventh level spell. I think that you can grab things like Circle of Death, which might be a sixth level spell. Overall, seventh level spells are kind of underwhelming. It's my opinion, but you can use that slot to upcast things. At 19, you are Sorcerer level 14, which means you have permanent flight. Congratulations, you are a low-grade angel at this point. You have permanent flight, you have smites, you have divine magic, you have arcane magic. You're a beast. And then level 20, your capstone is 8th level spells. Anti-magic field is actually a good option for you. Your weapon will lose its magic properties, but you'll still be able to use your Hex Warrior class feature, which means you'll still be able to beat people up with your charisma. You can shut down casters pretty aggressively just by being near them and beating them up. Not many classes have access to both anti-magic field and the ability to take advantage of that anti-magic field. So it's a good option. And that's pretty much where the end of this build comes. So I realize that, you know, this is always an option and you get to pick things that you want. But these are my recommendations. So whatever you want to go with, if you disagree with me, let me know. If you have any requests for builds or build ideas or homebrew that you want to see, I have a bunch of ideas that I'll be kind of converting into usable things for your table. But leave them down in a comment. I want to hear your suggestions, your ideas, your requests. And hopefully we can make them into a video on the channel. Thanks for your time and keep rolling those dice.